This is the first time in the history of all shows of energy that we have all these superstars sitting on this panel representing all their companies, and we're going to have a dialogue with, within us, but really with you. So I'm really excited. So <clears throat> guys, we have done some rehearsal, and Dr. Amin gave us a bit of a dissertation to read <laughs> for our panel. And thank you, Masood. And so the question is, we have heard uh, you know, early on from Badar uh, Khan from Direct Energy, which I think he did a phenomenal job explaining from the perspective of a competitive retailer what's going on and what's needed. Then we heard an interesting perspective from uh, Steve Wozniak. Uh, and then we heard the utility executive panel and the perspective of some utility executives about what's going on and what needs to happen. And the biggest challenge that utilities perhaps are dealing with is affordability. How do you pay for all these things? So to get right into it, to dive right into it, I'm curious, guys, uh, can somebody chime in and help the audience understand how is this Margaret Evolution go doing? What's going on in the US? What's going on globally? Who is winning? Is anybody losing? Can anybody want to jump in? I think um, in the United States, you know, one of the things that we're, we're wondering about is um, we had the stimulus funds, which uh, did its job in terms of um, stimulating deploy, you know, investment and deployment of technologies. And now the question is, what, what's going to happen post-stimulus? Do, you know, is the spending going to continue to be on an up, up curve? Is it going to flatten out or is it actually going to decrease? I think one of the things that in the United States, well, with all of us, that's very important is the business case associated with the technology has to be much very clear and articulated very well because without any artificial stimulus, the business case is going to be, going to be a strong component. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of winning out, one of the things that a good test for us is with the smart grid interoperability panel and the standards work that we're doing is which countries have come to us early on to partner with us. Mm -hmm. And Korea was the very first one, you know, three or four years ago. And I, you know, with the Jeju Island mm -hmm. program that they had, I see them as being really one of the countries in the forefront. Next was the 27 countries of the European Union and next was uh, Japan. But I think uh, what country that's, one country that's really done everything right in the last couple of years has been Ecuador. Wow. in Latin America, because their Minister of Electricity is a PhD in electrical engineering, a champion of smart grid, and they actually last year finished a countrywide strategy for smart grid with well-defined projects in three phases of time over the next 20 years. That's great. So I, I see, in Latin, well actually worldwide, I see them to be the most organized mm -hmm. and the furthest along. Got it. Anyone else? Masood? The smart grid has been a global phenomenon, and recent policy, uh, like John uh, mentioned, in the US, EU, uh, Europe, other parts of Europe, and Asia, and Latin America, has made it possible <clears throat> to look into a modernized grid. The needs are very different. The needs, the drivers in the West are usually decarbonization, environmental concerns, env empowerment of consumers, ability also to improve reliability and security of the system, and markets. Markets and policy that are conducive, that are supportive of the transformation. Developing parts of the world is different. They have explosive population growth, explosive need for uh, access to power and electricity at a cost that they can afford and reliability. So we are going to see very different paradigms globally. We are seeing it already. China will control 18.6, 18.2% of smart grid ready appliances by the end of 2015, by the end of next year. So it's a huge opportunity for innovation, not only on the microgrids and integration of renewables, but also on the products that we develop, whether it is for consumers or for the distribution and transmission and generation networks. Got it. So I think Anybody? I yeah, think Lisa? The, the issue is, is that we need to address it holistically. We've got a number of point solutions that are being addressed, but we're not looking at it holistically across the board. And actually, the slow ev evolution is a massive issue for the organ you know, for all of us in the industry. And the reason is, is it's the skills gap that is occurring. Um, obviously, we have an aging workforce that's out there. 
There's great technologies, great evolution from those capabilities, but those that have the knowledge don't want to come to this industry because it's not moving fast enough. Right. It's not enough innovation. So we have got to solve some of these regulatory issues um, across the board that allow the innovation to move at the speed at which those with high technology capabilities are going to address it. And he's going to stick something in my ear in a matter of a second here. <laughs> <laughs> grab this mic. You're getting a new mic. Who wants to go next? Yeah, so Scott? I, I guess from our perspective, one of the most interesting aspects of the question is that I agree completely with my colleagues in, in terms of the areas of, of innovation and growth. <laughs> Um, but the drivers are so different in different parts of the world. So, for example, we see in the developing world uh, a significant need just to keep up with growth, mm -hmm. as well as uh, rural electrification mm -hmm. is, a, is a fascinating trend. In the developed world, the whole idea of, of uh, distribution automation and microgrids and virtual power plants are really becoming quite popular mm -hmm. in in. in North America and in Europe, but for different reasons in North America and Europe. So it's uh, so it's a pretty fascinating uh, to look at the differences geographically. Right. So it's not about winning; it's about how well and how fast we learn from one another. Right. Right. But do you think? But do you think that everybody is spending the right time to create a strategy like Ecuador? Do you think that people are actually being introspective about that? Do you see that as part of the solution? Is that happening? There, is a, there are. There are efforts uh, globally, whether it's India, Bangalore, whether it's Turkey that you had worked on in Andres, and, uh, and other nations in Latin America, beginning in Africa, that they're looking at a systematic way and the whole system. So I think the key message that Steve shared this morning and Lisa mentioned, you got to think the whole system from fuel source all the way to the plug in, not just the plug in the wall, what are you using it for? Mm -hmm. And what's the best, if you will, mixture for that particular type of application? That is missing, the whole systems. Right. Uh, and that's the key message. The other part is there is an opportunity that developing nations are going to leapfrog us because they are moving a lot more in a more, they don't have much of a background and legacy system to retrofit. Uh, so there is real opportunity that they can actually, this century, if they do it right, they can actually not only make their systems better, mm -hmm. but they may leapfrog us economically for the size they have, right. per capita development. I, so I know that's a far thing, it's 2040, 2050 we're talking about, mm -hmm. and it's a function of many variables. I think to do that though, they're going to still have to get to the standards that you talked about, right, which is the, the interconnectivity between so, the So inter interoperability, when I hear standards, the key is interoperability. Absolutely. Does everybody know interoperability? Yeah, plug and play in the computer and all that? We didn't say plug and play. No. That's, that's for Steve. <laughs> That's for Steve, right. So, so, so let, let, me, well, let me give you another question and you can keep wrapping these topics, right? But, so what are the major challenges that are preventing success? So uh, interoperability would be one of our major challenges. And part of the challenge of getting to interoperability is the regulatory framework, at least in North America, that we work under. And it's very hard to find the incentives to work out the standards. But why? Are. Why, Gary? Tell us why. Get into it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the way the utilities are incented to make money. They are not incented to go out and do basic R&D research in order to spend the time to develop the tools that are required to achieve the standards that we've seen in other industries. It, it's, a, it's a significant barrier. And then you combine on top of that the legacy infrastructure that's in place that would need to be invested in and upgraded in order to achieve that. It's a very daunting challenge that the industry face. On that, yeah. uh, Go ahead, Scott. On that one point about, the, about particularly the U.S. regulatory structure, I think, however, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. I think we have seen some things recently in the U.S. that are quite novel that regulators have been have been pushing and agreeing to you look at other parts of the world particularly Europe it's 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 not the same it's uh, it's much more difficult to get new regulatory change through. Yeah, I don't know if there's any regulators in the room, but I would hate to be a regulator these days because you look at what you're regulating, the utilities are under top line pressure and bottom line pressure, and then you've got the residential consumer under rising price pressure. There's, it, there's a hard, it's hard to make a win out of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to comment about the federal versus state, and that's really one of the challenges that we face with, with regulation. 
Even look at this state here in Texas, which is a deregulated state, but where are the incentives, for example, for the utilities in this state to invest in energy efficiency programs? The business model just doesn't support it. There could be a federal regulation which mandates efficiency, but the, the utilities are not going to invest unless there's a rate recovery process so they can recover their, their investments. I think one other challenge, I think we've touched on it, we do have aging infrastructure. And the people working on that infrastructure, as mentioned this morning, are even older than the infrastructure. So we sort of have a convergent of, convergence of aging, aging infrastructure that we need to address. And that's also part of the policy and part of the challenges that we face. Right. Yeah. You know, I echo our colleagues that policy needs reform. And when you look at the federal policy versus PUCs, especially for utilities who operate in many states, several states, it's a hodgepodge. How do I justify this here to these pieces? And if you're looking at the, that we have a divide between bulk power and below 30,000 volts, 100 kV, and below we have a divide, and the lower voltage systems are under the, mostly under PUCs. Every incentive for renovation, for upgrade, modernization, or even research and development, unfortunately gets derailed at the local level. Mm -hmm. And we can have the greatest system design from the backbone, but when it gets to the arteries and to the limbs, the system is not working as efficiently. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about this, but when you look at research and development, we used to put in 0.32% of net sales in this sector into research and development between 95 and 2000. That number is, was the third lowest among all industrialized sectors. The top 10 led by manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, telecom, put in between six and 13%. Unfortunately, in the last 10 years, that 0.32 has dropped to 0.17. Now it's the lowest, only second to pulp and paper, Dog food industry spends more in R&D than we do in this sector, both dollar-wise and percentage-wise. Entertainment, <laughs> Disney spends more in R&D per capita for their return than we do in this sector. So that has to change. And we have a great opportunity, I'll give you an example. At the University of Minnesota, we have about 120 seniors in electrical and computer engineering. Power is not a required class. How many of, the, it's an elective. How many undergraduates do you think take the power sequence? It's not required. Very small. But Very 117 small. to 119. So people are excited. Young kids have the same idealism that you may experience in this room even more, but they're pragmatic. So there is a high level of interest. Question is, do we have jobs for them? Right. With an aging workforce in the mid-50s, are we going to have opportunities for them to really modernize the system, not only in the US, but North America and global? Sure. So how do we accelerate things? Where are the answers? How do we fix things? What needs to change? Regulatory construct, business models, how will we build these utilities of the future, a new, a new paradigm? What needs to happen? But I think we need to work backwards from the problem, which is there are other people that are going to solve from the consumer backwards and from the businesses backwards. And it's, the, you know, it's that last mile to the home, last mile to the business. And if we work backwards from there, the question is, is now it's going to be a race of who solves for that? So we're not solving for it, but the comps guys are solving for it. The appliance vendors are solving for it, right? Are they going to be the ones that then dictate back to this industry how it's actually addressed? So they will figure out the business problem because they're going to work from the people that are paying from it back. Well, absolutely. The industry will the industry will either adapt or we will face new competitors. I mean, if you look at the um, you know the Comcast Apple that was spoken of earlier, those type of arrangements will look at this industry and say, wow, that's a very attractive space that we can enter and find a way to be competitive. So it's going to be and the ecosystem, so it, I think it's exactly that. It, it can that. happen. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's no guarantees. It's very Darwinian when you look at it. Very Darwinian. That, that the, those who master this are going to prosper, are going to do very well. Those who don't are not going to. But however, the pinch point again is cost recovery return on investment and policy that's supportive of the modernization. Part so I think, yeah, no, I think it's, um, if you look at what, what are the measures of success, you know, for us going forward, and I think we've all agreed, it's, we've talked about technology, we've talked about standards, and we've talked about policy. And I see these as really equally weighted, 
and they all they all need attention. And so I think, how, how you know what do we do going forward? We have to make sure that we invest in, in the technology. We need to make sure that um, we all work together to make sure the standards we need are developed. You know, and and the and why standards have become more important is you know we. We still sell microprocessor-based devices, but really the greater benefit to the organization is with an integrated solution, mm -hmm. right? Taking the components and integrating them together into a solution like distribution automation. But those components are from different vendors, right. and how do we make sure they interoperate? They all have to comply with the same standard, right? Mm -hmm. And be tested for interoperability. So standards is important in policy. Just think if, um, like um, Wade from AEP, you know, think if, if you're a CEO of AEP, you could have an overall strategy for smart grid, but you operate in 11 different states. Mm -hmm. So you really need 11 different strategies from a policy point of view yeah. to be successful. And, uh, and that's just a very, a very complicated situation. So I, I see attention on all three of those. Mm -hmm. is very so key. The, there's one other area, I think, besides the three that John mentioned that, that we need to understand better. We've been talking about all of the technology innovations and the, and, the, and the hurdles and everything else, but the business models that are going to be associated with the smart grid going forward are in some ways much more challenging to understand and implement in a profitable manner than the technologies that are used by those business models. So for example, uh, there will be new interactions between supply and demand, and you could, you could you know, give example after example after example of this, and there will be a lot of new actors. And, they'll, and it'll be a function of what's allowed regulatorily in the different states and in Europe and elsewhere. But in, we now have aggregators, we have traders, we, we have the ability for end users to arbitrage and to store energy, presumably. But how all those folks fit together and, and who does what and what the business models and rules are are even more challenging than the technologies behind it, I would submit. Right, right. So, so, so what about the concept on interoperability around the notion of this plug and play of all these standards and, and how do we get there? Does that mean that we need to embrace Internet of Things and we need a platform uh, so that all these power devices can, can interoperate? So it, it hits me back to one of the companies that I'm extremely associated with, funded Proximetry. Mm -hmm. Tracy Tran, are you here? Raise your hand. Uh, the IoT platform, he's somewhere. Uh, so do we need do we need more of this or or how do we but get I, there? I think it's going to be the dialogue amongst us. It's no different than Steve talking this morning about Apple shares going down when they weren't open and going up when they were. And mm -hmm. I think that'll happen exactly to all of us. And you know it's going to be the conversation. And the onus will end up being very much on us working backwards from that and deciding what those communications are because there is no overall governing body to do that. And there will be no single platform, right? There is no single OS. Today. today, then you go to a substation. Let's say you're a repairman, line crews. Whatever you plug in, somebody somewhere has to manually input that, that such and such was added. Then you run contingency analysis again, depending on what has been added. Why can't we develop power electronics and software interface that is self-aware, you plug it in like a USB device? Mm -hmm. says, oh, such and such added, work that immediately into the equations and up, could update the system, reduces human error, we can do it. So technology, for the most part, is there to do it. The question is, is the opportunity to do that? Can we recover the cost? Can we sell the product at a, in a way that would, we can make money on it? Mm -hmm. And the companies that purchase that can benefit from it. So if we really want to improve the system, we need every node to be awake, to be smart, to be responsive, to be minimum footprint on the environment, and to be able to be digging to the data at a very fast speed, to get analytics out of it, to know what's going on, to be able to take corrective action, preventive action before it happens. At the same time, not just reliability, but there's a huge potential for electricity. It's a tool maker's dream because it's pre precise, you can target how it is used, and it's the most efficient carrier of energy globally. Mm -hmm. We are not harnessing the value of electricity yet. And it's gonna take quite a bit of change to do that. So I think there's great opportunity for standards in that area, connectivity of, internet of things, connectivity from micro, from nano to the macro level. 
the whole range from your local little device, cell phone, smartphone, all these devices, all the way to the entire interconnection. Right. So, so, what about, so what about the fact that solar is penetrating, that electric vehicles are penetrating, that people want to manage their appliances and, and you know, do this thing called megawatts, which eventually translates into the virtual power plant. Can, what's going to happen to the grid today if nothing changes in the utilities design of that grid? They Where are we heading? Where are we heading? They get disrupted. Well, I think one of the speakers well, yeah. this morning had said he could uh, convert uh, um, I think it was the gentleman from Blue Bonnet said he could basically convert his system to a subscription, 40 bucks a month or something like that. That's where you go. You go to a subscription basis where you're on the grid for X amount a month, and then your power is aggregated on out top of that. in a different way on, on top of that, right? And that's a, it's a pretty easy model to conceptualize. It's very difficult to implement given the environment that we work in. I think what you know we have to learn from because this is very new for us in the United States is learn from uh, those utilities that have experienced high penetrations of rooftop solar PV mm -hmm. on the distribution system. And a good examples are San Diego and California, San Diego Gas Electric and Arizona Public Service. And what we find was if you have like 35 percent of the homes on the same feeder with rooftop solar PV. Think of the uh, tap changer in the substation. It's a mechanical control device. <clears throat> Instead of operating two, three, four times a day, it's now operating over 100 times a day because of the increased volatility mm -hmm. as the clouds and the fog mm -hmm. move in and out. So we, we find, and this is from a research point of view, you know, Masood, is new applications of power electronics because of the increased volatility to the grid of a power electronic-based tap changer control. Uh, dynamic uh, VAR compensation devices that we install on the low voltage network mm -hmm. where the disruption occurs with the rooftop solar PV mm -hmm. and now with the uh, change, the amendment to IEEE standard 1547, we can now use inverters mm -hmm. to provide voltage and reactive power compensation. So there's, it's, it's a new, it's basically a new world on a distribution system with the increased volatility, but we have you know, we have thought through it. There's new uh, power electronic um, solutions, but this is very new for us. We're just, just embarking on this. So speaking of that, one of our sponsors, Gridco, makes a, a great power electronics tool, right? And also in the audience, we have a company called Vision Energy, which makes energy storage for the grid. And I'm curious, where does energy store come in? Does it replace all the tap changers? Right, and is it a new way of dealing with energy storage? So I'm here, curious to see what, the, what your thoughts are on that. And and, and, and and again, the whole notion of th how do we redesign the grid to take the, to deal with the reality that DG is happening? It's happening at a massive speed. The genie's out of the bottle. Right. What do we do? John is right on target that he wrote excellent article for intelligent utility, I believe, in that area, showing what the benefits are. And then he wrote a shorter version for IEEE Smart Grid newsletter that's available online. For storage, power electronic-based storage, flywheels, you can do very small, 5 kV, distributed throughout the building. So imagine, this is a crazy idea, I know, but behind the, the electrical uh, switch, the plug, you have one of these sitting for some, not every switch, but for applications that you're going to need uninterruptible power. Or we pay for power conditioning. It can be built into the actually wall outlet. So instead of that sad looking face you see on the power outlet, it can be a very happy face in that power outlet with local control, local capability, local compensation to run critical equipment for a short period of time all the way to massive storage. If you're gonna really genuinely integrate renewables, we're gonna need a different backbone, addition, added backbone for the high voltage transmission, and we're gonna need massive storage. Yeah. We talk about plug-in vehicles as distributed storage. It can be done, but it depends on a, a lot of variables. How much penetration you have, what kind of wiring you have, can you do fast charger? Mm -hmm. So there's huge opportunity in that area. Thermal storage. The, Right now, if I had to bet on something, and I don't invest at all in anything that I advise the government on, I put it on 401ks, I would say thermal storage, combined heat and power, has a, has a huge potential. 
But in terms of materials, there are many advances in that area. We still have a long way to go. So do you see, do you see a grid? Go ahead. Storage is going to be, I think, a key element of the grid going forward. If nothing else, at the basic level, it allows us to decouple generation from consumption or, or load. And that can apply anywhere in the grid, whether it's applied at the transmission level or at the home level or possibly community. I think for distributed energy resources, what you're going to see is the convergence of microgrid technology with storage, with uh, distributed generation such as solar PV where you can operate it connected to the grid to, re to meet renewable portfolio standards. You can operate separate from the grid for resiliency and the storage coupled with the renewable energy uh, generation gives you some flexibility in terms of being able to dispatch that generation. At least allows you to help manage the ramp rates whenever a cloud goes over a solar PV. Storage, though, is being applied across the grid. There's applications where you can use it in lieu of spinning reserve at the generation level. The system that was installed up in Alaska, which is a 40 megawatt uh, system, is basically to offset diesel generation sitting idling with spinning reserve. So you can use it to increase our generation capacity instead of a 5% reserve margin on each generation facility. You can put in a battery at the, at the generation plant and free up additional, additional capacity. It can be used with community uh, type of microgrids as well. So we see it at the generation and transmission level for transient stability and spinning reserve. We can see it for load shifting or peak shaving. We also see it for resiliency, and then we see it coupled uh, to uh, distributed generation at the home or, or rooftop. And also people can use it to store up solar during the day and charge their electric vehicles at night. Yeah, Scott. So um, I agree completely with the professor and Gary, but I would take a little bit of exception to saying that we will redesign the grid. We, we won't, we can't, it's too big. We will evolve the grid into a hybrid mm -hmm. between Tell us about it. between the existing centralized generation, which will stay there right. for 40 or 50 years. We're not going to build any brand new huge centralized generation, but we'll be investing in microgrids with distributed energy resources all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I hate to, to drag this analogy out too far, <laughs> but it will be not unlike from a resiliency perspective the internet. Yes. So you could you could have failures locally that will not affect wide areas right. because we'll, we'll be architecting them to be standalone and to be, and to be able to, to be withdrawn. Right. But, but we'll, we'll get there in an evolutionary fashion. Mm -hmm. just to build I agree on, wholeheartedly. Yeah, I just, I just yeah. wanted to build on yeah. Scott's point though. I think we have seen an evolution to the grid. We saw smart meters, we saw distribution, grid management. Now we're looking at distributed energy resources. If we look at the business case though, investments to automate the distribution system, investments in distributed energy resources. The value in that is what can we do with our capacity requirements on the generation side? That's where the real money is that's going to drive how we can monetize distributed energy resources and how we can monetize some of the efficiency investments that we make in the grid. I agree wholeheartedly. In the developed parts of the world that we have sunk in investment, for example, in North America, we currently have about 450,000 miles of 100 kV and higher voltage lines, 100,000 100, volts to about 800,000 volts. In order to integrate renewables into it, we need to add that another 9% to that, that 42,000 miles. Today's wire is about $2 million a mile, so about $82, $84 billion over 10 years, $8 billion a year to enable stronger grid 40% of electricity can come from wind, if we do that. We can offset not only some of the polluting sources, but to electrify transportation. Mm -hmm. However, that doesn't, that's not a silver bullet. People right. often, often argue, do we need a totally decentralized system with microgrids, with local intelligent distribution network, or do we need a stronger backbone? The truth answer from a resilience, from a security, from also markets and ability to transfer, basically Alexander Hamilton's vision of networks of commerce, you need that backbone. So the challenge is how do we remove the obstacles, policy uncertainty mm -hmm. on these investments? We need both actually. Locally to have microgrids that integrate local sources are as efficient as possible and are resilient locally as well as connected to the backbone that brings in 
from long distances. A lot of these 42,000 miles will be DC lines, which will be very different than what we're used to. So Tesla and Edison's dream is merging more and more together. Mm -hmm. Whether it was AC, long distance travel by Tesla, versus Thomas Edison distribute locally, generate locally DC network, is finally is gonna happen. And you're throwing in Alexander Graham Bell's vision on top of that, <laughs> except with wireless and also with fiber optic lines and so on, which is an exciting century to be in. Absolutely. You yeah. know, to, to piggyback on what you said, Masood, I, I think back to, remember when the Chinese first uh, talked about their smart grid plans? They said, before we have a smart grid, we need a strong grid. Right. Great. And I think that was very, we hadn't heard that before, and I think that was so true. With, you can't, you, you don't want to layer new technology on top of a weak foundation. Correct. Um, but you think about our distribution system, and I think one of the biggest, if not the biggest uh, uh, advantage here, the, the pluses with Smart Grid is more focus on the distribution system. Mm -hmm. We have 48,000 distribution substations. You know how many of those have any kind of automation in them in the United States? Less, less than half. And then of those that have automation, less than half of those were using the two-way communications and the automation devices, so they're operating standalone. It's just tremendous potential for benefit, you know, that's, that's untapped. And I think the other thing with distribution, too, is, is um, the cultural, where you have the technology, but there's cultural resistance to closing the loop on applications in the distribution system. Once we're um, confident in the logic for fault detection, isolation, restoration, let's close the loop and restore upstream and downstream rather than having a human in the loop. And the second thing is distributed intelligence. It's not, it's not, we don't have to have this, the old centralized structure right. of bringing all the data up to the control center, having decisions made, and then carry that downstream again. Agreed. Agreed. That, I see, I knew all along that by the time I left Foster Energy and we had put substation, uh, fiber to every substation, that we were way ahead of the game. <laughs> Because most well, yeah. people don't have anything. That's right. On developing parts of the world. For example, where you were before coming uh, project you did back in Turkey, how much, what percentage of do you think substations have SCADA or connected? Autom any form of automation? Very ask, little. I could ask Andres. Very little. Yeah. Very little. Less than ten percent. Less than ten percent. Even worse, in Africa, they, there is no African grid. Right. And <laughs> you, so you, the best solution actually, going back to the comment. For, for developing parts of the world may not be that backbone. But the only concern is if you are using generation that dependent on local fossil fuels, uh, to be able to regulate that is gonna be a nightmare. Because there are gonna be these polluting parts all over the place spread out. How do you really do that? So mm -hmm. again, it goes back a fresh thinking. How do you develop microgrids that are as efficient as possible? And how do you judiciously connect them together both from reliability, security, and environmental footprint, and economic factors. Right. So take, for example, Tesla. Isn't Tesla building their own virtual microgrid in a way? If you have own a Tesla, mm -hmm. and they're building you know, 200, 300, eventually 1,000 supercharging stations, they use solar panels and natural gas turbines, which basically are off the grid. And so for all intended purposes, if you're a Tesla owner, and you're charging all these things, and you don't pay because you own the car, Tesla is, you know, is building its own microgrid, right? So what does that do to the business model? Is, are, you gonna, are we going to see more of that, those efforts, people building their own grids, people building their own business models that doesn't even deal with the utility? Sure, yeah. and, and there's been a lot of speculation in the industry about the quote-unquote death spiral, you know, and we're mm -hmm. seeing some of it come true in Germany, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but, as I said earlier, I think there is hope that um, the regulators are very well aware of this and, and are looking for ways to implement these or allow the implementation of these new business models. We saw, we've seen some things in California and in Arizona recently that where regulators are adopting sort of uh, a grid charge, if you will, right, mm -hmm. in, instead of paying for kilowatt hours. And that's, that's where it needs to go. The, mm -hmm. the, the stability, the reliability of the grid needs to be paid for independent of the kilowatt hours. Right. So, so, what if, so what if I needed transactive energy? What if I wanted to sell my kilowatt hours from my solar panel to my mom in Detroit, but I live in Austin? 
When are we going to see that? When is that going to happen? That kind of tagging, electrons, as you know, uh, as we all know, do not uh, do not follow a prescribed path. Mm -hmm. So, so we are we are told that you are buying green energy, mm -hmm. when in reality we are getting it from probably a generator that has nothing to do with green. Mm -hmm. However, in aggregate, we are helping that move forward. Mm -hmm. So let's say you want to really sell that same electron, that electron that you have to your mom in Detroit, or to me, Minnesota, because we need electricity when it's so cold. <laughs> you, it, what it is, it's a very, you need a DC system that's not going to work. Um, it's not cost effective to do that type of thing. So you look at aggregate and tagging. We already do tagging. We do between systems, uh, companies like OATI, others, and, and NERC had many projects in this area back in the 90s and early this past decade. You tag it. So in aggregate, you see the area control error. You see also how these connected seams to other regions mm -hmm. between, for example, PJM to MISO or, or various parts of the eastern interconnection or west coast. Uh, in, you see that in aggregate, and you see there are certain days that there's a flow one way, and the other days, you know, it moves around. So it's not the same electron, but it's in balance. You balance the system. Yeah. And that's the critical thing. Many people, most of the colleagues in the room are from the industry, so they know the physics of it, how it works. Mm -hmm. But for what we have failed to communicate to the public is not to take this for granted. Yeah. I think, so, I think I, ambivalence I, I, is the biggest thing that we've got to get away from. For you to actually be willing to sell that, you actually have to care. And the general business owner, even owners of businesses, don't care about this on a daily basis, right? It's an entitlement mm -hmm. in many, many countries mm -hmm. um, to where this is. Yeah, and care. right up to the point that, what did we say upstairs? It was, you know, until you can't charge your cell phone, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, all hell, is, bre all hell is breaking <laughs> loose. But... In order to be able to do that, to set up the right trading exchanges, again, the technologies are here. The capabilities, in many ways, are here. Right. But we've got to get to the point where yeah. the mass market actually cares about this. So it really is about um, transparency of information and the issues, right? We, we, so much as an industry, protect the consumers from what the situation is. Yeah that we'd have to go back and look at other industries and when they did the transformation. Right. And we made it important to the consumers. And they spoke, and you worked again backwards from that particular situation. So I don't think it's a technology challenge. Gotcha. Well, hold that thought, because the reason I bring all this is because actually there's a startup here, an Austin startup, called Gridmates. And they have this transacted platform. So George, are you around? Stand up. Say hello. So that's George. So go ahead, Gary. I was just going to make the comment that in terms of the Internet of Things, I think we're closer than you might realize in terms of the utility industry. You have aggregators who are sending signals to consumers, maybe not residential consumers because there's a whole issue around engagement of residential consumers, but commercial industrial customers, which for the average utility is about 50% of their load. They, have all, they all have smart meters. They all think money and economics, there's no emotion involved in it, and they're communicating with aggregators. Now, if aggregators are communicating with utilities and it's machine-to-machine -machine communication, where this happens once the, once the programs are set up automatically, you are now moving toward the Internet of Things. You can do the same thing at the residential level, but there's consumer engagement. There's also the infrastructure in the homes that will automatically respond to pricing signals. And then somebody has to provide those pricing signals that make sense to the end use consumer. And we have some work to do there yet. Mm -hmm. Exactly on the same line. Internet of Things is not new. It's the new branding of that, similar sure. to the way the cloud is really branding, branding for the big computers, DEC, IBM, others we used to use back in the 70s That's and right. early 80s. So data and intelligence from that data actionable is the key. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with it? Currently, on an average utility, mid-sized utility, we generate about 70, 75 terabytes of data. Depending on what instrumentation we put in, and not just people think if they have a smart meter, they have a smart grid. That's only a note. We are talking about end-to-end -end system, mm -hmm. that you're seeing what's going on. You can actually close loops where loops have never been closed before right. to give the control to the consumer as well as for reliability of the system to the stakeholder who controls it. We are going to increase that 72 terabytes 
to 840, 860 terabytes. It's a tsunami of data. Our colleagues tell us at IBM elsewhere, Masood, don't worry about it. We have that for breakfast. It's not a big deal. But to turn that really quickly in the order of tens of milliseconds, or let's say 200 milliseconds, one-fifth of a second, into actionable intelligence it's is a big been, challenge. It's never, never been, been done, done before. before. But can be done. The question is, can we join forces, public, private, mostly private, so, to make that happen? So is the answer a, 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 a nested network of grids that can be islanded at will, that some are, you know, I'm the Dell Children's Hostel here in town, that we put a cogeneration system forward, and if the grid goes down, they, can, they have black star that can be up and running on their own. And all the way to a community or a neighborhood, maybe they all want to go solar and they build their grid. Or maybe it's Walmart and McDonald working with Westlake Energy that want to get off the grid using cogeneration. You're right on target, Andres. Also, don't forget the 3,000 bases of Department of Defense. We are currently, majority, almost all of them here and, and elsewhere, are connected to the local power company. And that's risky. So how do you make these bases as efficient? And some of the equipment there are very power hungry. Uh, how do you make them as efficient, as self-supporting, and ability to be able to separate from the grid using power electronics and other means? That can be huge pilots, or if you will, application areas for many of the technologies. And whenever DOD, uh, supports or applies the technology, the rest of the economic sectors that are not even connected to defense benefit from that. So, so I, this I, is an opportunity. I have a question. Folks. So, so, and sorry, I don't mean to take over your panel, Andreas, but when you talk Please about do. when when you talk about We're Walmart friends. going off the grid <laughs> and and you know other the microgrid for the hospital associated with oh that's great, but if you're a utility, all of a sudden my revenues are going down. And then you want to pay for all this other stuff. You want to generate terabytes of data. That's going to cost money. How does the business model work if the revenues are going down and we're trying to make all of this investment? I, and, and Andreas, I'll throw it out to the panel. But I think that's a huge challenge in the industry. I agree. Yeah, but, the cha but the bigger challenge is this. And I go back to Lisa and the fact that they're so focused on customer engagement and what customers want. The customers will do what they want. Commercial, industrial, and residential customers uh, already want to buy cars from Christian Okonski and KLD Energy, and they want to use those cars from vehicle to grid and grid to vehicle. I mean, the genie's out of the bottle, guys. So the residential consumer and all, all the cost rides on the back of the residential consumer who can't afford solar or, uh, or energy storage. You're absolutely right. That biggest worry among the utilities is how do I do uh, What's going to happen that I can not only reduce my uh, consumption, my area, but generate revenue. Some states have passed laws, including back in Minnesota years ago, that you get cost recovery based on how much reduction you do. So you don't lose money, you make money. Many states have not done that. Second part is, uh, for this upgrade, we cannot, in a sense, leave others behind. Right. We need to build these public-private partnerships. And there have been mechanisms for funding that, whether it is uh, public, uh, pub, uh, what is called National Infrastructure Bank that used to have bipartisan support. Uh, on targeted projects with clear milestones, or whether it's private funding, but not on everything, on key things. And I would say start with demos in 20 notes, 10 notes, and show that it can work, that the companies make money they reduce the rates. I know it's crazy to say that. Reduce the rates while you make money. But Texas has one of the greatest experiments going in deregulation. And the way, part of the way, not the entire way, but part of the way their smart metering rollout um, was got, paid for. pushed through. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, well, paid for. It yeah. was paid for based on a monthly fee. But mm -hmm. the way it went through, because there were a lot of blockers, was there was something in the legislation that allowed low income constituencies to benefit from it. And I guess what I'm hearing, we've got to make this big investment, which is fair, and I think we've got to, but you know, what of the of all the consumers? It can't just be for the industrial, it can't Absolutely. just be for construct, the construct industrial, it can't be for the high end residential. There's a good segment of the population that doesn't pay the biggest part of the bill. Well, sure. Well, actually many, there will many. there will always be politics involved in yeah. it, but you know I think we heard this morning 
that the mindset has to be that the industry is now an electricity service provider and not just selling kilowatt hours. That's so right. all of those threats that you just referenced a second ago are all opportunities for the, the existing utilities if they can turn their own uh, their own organization that way and get their regulators to uh, to allow them to do it. Yeah. So so we, we need, I want to get to questions. So if you want to start lining out for the mic. Uh, Give us a, a, a you know a thirty second sense from each of you or less about what what does the grid look like in twenty thirty? It's a hybrid grid. Is it all utility control? Is it all microgrid centric? What's going to look like, John? I think um, we talked about. I think the the uh, the distribution system will be much will know have a much better idea of what's happening on distribution. We'll be able to manage that much better mm -hmm. and will be much more efficient mm -hmm. with respect to that part of the grid. I do think we're going to see more um, microgrids. I've I've seen a lot more interest. In fact, we did a recent report for the state of Minnesota, yeah. Department of Energy Resources. How how can states are saying how can we encourage more investment mm -hmm. in microgrids? You know what what do we need to do? So I think we'll see more of that. Um, I think what's interesting is how we, the EMS of the future, to me is, is, is something that we haven't talked about yet. But That's energy management system. The, 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 the control center <laughs> system, the real-time computer-based control system that's in the, that controls the generation and transmission part of the grid, yep. it's going to be revolutionized from a point of how we control generation mm -hmm. because uh, we're going to have large blocks of, of renewables, intermittent mm -hmm. generation, our traditional generation. But then I think we'll see a lot more demand response That's right. that we can pull the trigger on as a tool that the dispatchers could use. So instead of uh, ramping units up when the area controller goes up, mm -hmm. we can maybe pull the trigger on some demand response. So I see a new application of resource optimization that runs in real time mm -hmm. uh, on the generation transmission. Lisa. I think we're going to see, obviously, the, uh, the OTIT side will be finally fully integrated. Obviously the de Operational technology, informational technology Sorry. coming yeah. together. Obviously the decentralized um, power and then the two-way power flow obviously I think will be huge. But I think it's also going to end up being a service back to the microgrids. The, the uh, CNI customers are going to choose how they want to mm -hmm. you know, play with the grid. Right? Absolutely. Whether it's the businesses or the end consumers, we're going to decide you know, in 30 years how we want to actually integrate with the grid. And so it may be that the, that's where the utilities are having to remake themselves or remake the businesses completely in such a way that they can have separate businesses that are maybe not so regulated that allow for that to happen. Scott? So I agree with all of that. The only thing that we haven't really talked about too much today that I, that I definitely see um, is that we're going to see uh, a lot more power electronics controlling the grid, and the power electronics will be of the, the newer variety that can handle the, uh, the higher voltages, right? Spikes. Uh, and, and, and that research is being done and funded today uh, uh, all over the place, but the federal government recently put, I think, $70 million in North Carolina to accomplish this. Mm -hmm. So we will see uh, low-voltage DC buses mm -hmm. in buildings, in residentials, in, in um, residential homes, so we don't have all of the conversion back and forth between DC, AC, DC, AC. So mm -hmm. it'll be a lot more efficient and, and uh, cost effective. Yeah, Gary, quickly. Quick items, more, more storage. I think we'll see the cost point for energy storage drop. Uh, DC, I'm an advocate of DC as well, both at the transmission level as well as at the distribution level and data centers. More automation for reliability and efficiency of the grid and more automation on the consumer side so that we can drive better management of distributed energy resources. There is a convergence of OTIT, but also a convergence of managing demand response technologies and also managing the grid. Thank you. I'm going to talk at 4 o'clock, so I will go in more detail. But I think uh, electricity shall prevail at the quality, at the price that consumers are demanding or willing to pay. And whether it is uh, for social justice issues, fairness, there are already utilities such as PSENG New Jersey because of savings that they have from natural gas prices being low. They're reinvesting it into the modernized grid and putting in a lot of the radio networks and distribution automation otherwise. Another factor that we haven't talked about is changing risk. 
Mm -hmm. The changes that we have had in the climate have created extreme weather impact, much more, much more frequent, and the range of them have become very, very hard. We used to have two to five outages, major outages a year, caused by weather in the United States in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s. In mid-1990s, that started going up. Now we have 70 to 130 major outages a year caused by weather. It used to account for 17 to 22 percent of all the root causes of outages. Now it is somewhere between 67 to 74 percent of all the major root causes. I will show you some of this. So uh, we need a much more resilient, smarter, stronger system. So it sounds like you're making a business case for off-grid, microgrids. Go so, on. So I'll, I'll, play, I'll play the role of contrarian again and say we're going to have to have a, a uh, major event that will create a compelling event or for there to be um, something different in the industry. And I would suggest perhaps that the failure or near failure of a utilities business model might be a compelling event to get us the catalyst we need to move forward gotcha. with all of these investments. Gotcha. Let's go to questions. Great. Uh, my name is Erin. I'm a grad student at UT Austin. Thanks for your insight. Uh, my question is regarding the use of power electronics for grid stability and the economics surrounding um, whenever those power electronics are owned by third parties. So whenever you have distributed solar, um, you can have a feed-in tariff or net metering because there's a market value for that energy. But whenever you're talking about something like voltage, um, whenever third parties get involved, who pays and how much is it worth? Okay, well, only one question, one answer. Who wants to take that? John, maybe. Go over. Thank you. John or Gary or Scott, well, anybody. I'll, I'll, go ahead. I'll, I'll, anybody. Very, very quickly. You know, in Europe, it's mandated that the inverters on um, solar be available to utilities to be able to control volt bar quality on the distribution lines. It's not the case in the U.S., but, um, but there's a lot of people looking at that technically to, to think about how we can use those resources. So I think we'll see that. John. One, one, one example might be, you know, for years we've had uh, electric utilities require the power factor at the delivery point with, a, like, a large industrial customer to be a, a certain level. Mm -hmm. And if not... Right there's a fine to the customer, so we could. There's that's that's been a good model where the cost of the power factor correction equipment is borne by the by the industrial customer. Right. So at the delivery point, they have to be a certain level or above. So I think it's something to be worked out. But it could be that you know there needs to be certain criteria at the connection point, and and some of that could be done by the um, whoever the uh, the developer, the owner of the of the panel, or it could be shared. Sounds, sounds like a revenue opportunity for the utility that the residential <laughs> customer needs to pay. I like right. it. Thank Who's you. next? Yeah, hi. Obviously, we know that both uh, solar panels and, and storage and really a lot of the consumer level electronics and even LED lighting is intrinsically DC. And I know you, you kind of stole my thunder with, the, with your comment there at the end about the efficiency of not switching back and forth again. So and I'm going to try to reformulate my question and ask, at the consumer level, what do you see that looking like as far as are we going to have DC outlets in our house? Are we going to try to convert certain circuits of our existing mm -hmm. wiring to be DC? Or what do you see that looking like? Once I would. It, it really depends on the construction code, building code. Mm -hmm. And it is totally possible to have a totally DC building. And the feeder basically is, makes it, converts it to DC. So you have no power uh, quality issues. You will have a lot more controllability. Like a ship or a submarine or aircraft, but you don't need that level of sophistication at a building level. So you don't have to worry about it to become uh, a mega infrastructure such as what we use in ships and submarines. I think you're going to see a trickle down from industrial applications. Data centers are a primary example where you have a number of AC to DC conversions which are very inefficient. And now you're seeing the emergence of, of uh, DC data centers. And I think that technology will also flow down. On ships, you see DC because it's more compact, it's more efficient, it's also more expensive. And so as those cost issues and applications work out, you'll see that move down to smaller and smaller applications. 
But, but only expensive unless those data centers have their own gas fire turbines and they're right there on a real hookup. So, 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 so I'm, I'm pushing you all around. So, so real quick, there is an interesting company here, that, uh, David Carlin, uh, Solid Green Systems. Are you all around? Stand up. So he makes a, he makes a, a, a smart, uh, fr a green, uh, a smart uh, steel frame. Uh, styrofoam insulation. He puts sensors in this frame, in this building, in these frames, with for humidity and air quality, and and all this stuff. Back so he's EMS building station. actually buildings that are EMS truly smart. intelligent. Yeah. Okay. So go ahead. Question. So imagine, pardon me. Imagine yeah. that building with totally DC and with combined heat, power, and chilling. You get probably 90 plus percentage kind of system efficiency. That's right. For that, maybe more even for that building. Mm -hmm. That's smart, that is eco sensitive, and saves you money. Building pays for itself over time. Depends what you build, of course. That's right. So at the consumer level, is, uh, what do we need to do to get that rolling? We need to change the regulatory, the, the building. Really what codes. Greg mentioned, though, it's not the solution for everybody. And as right. my other Greg mentioned, it may not be the solution. You need the cost recovery. You need also code, building code to support that. I served on the board on infrastructure at the National Academy of Engineering for six years. Believe it or not, we talked about this from 2001 to 2007, exactly what you're thinking about. Uh, can we do that? So, so it's not a new concept, but it's time for it. If we can make that happen by 2030, 2020 maybe, it can be done. So I've got a few more questions. So I'm going to take another five minutes, guys. Keep going. <clears throat> So my question was more geared toward how much large-scale testing has been done to proving different types of smart grid technologies. Like you all been talking about all the different ideas that we have and the different implementation processes, but have we like done any big large-scale like taking an entire city and converting it? Uh, yes, phaser measurement units, PMUs or synchro phasers that used to be deployed only mostly Pacific Northwest and AEP are more, because of stimulus plan. They went from 100 and there are boxes that give you MRI quality based on what Terry Boston at PJM calls it. MRI quality understanding what's going on in the system 50 times a second if you choose to versus SCADA that gives you measurements every two to four seconds which is black and white x-ray. So it has been deployed. We have gone from 100 to 200. We're going to be over 1,000 by the end of this year that give you full situational awareness much faster to close the loop and take corrective action. So at that level, don't expect smart grid to all of a sudden magically show up and hit us on the head. As you heard, it's an evolution. So that's on the transmission side. Local, you have distribution automation. Mr. George, actually, we have Dr. George Arnold in the room. NIST is doing a terrific job on the standard side, whether it's cybersecurity, interoperability in that area. So on the distribution side, there are many companies that, that have fielded that, implemented it, and there are over 99 projects, part of the stimulus plan, that have shown that for every million you invest in smart grid, you generate $2.4 million. So, so absolutely, please search SGIG, DOE, you will find a lot of them. Or go to IEEE Smart Grid, uh, you will find the newsletter. There are three and a half years worth of coverage of those, many of these pilot projects there. And I will be happy to talk with you. Okay. Next question. Your Jeju Island was a good example. Yeah. Your Jeju Island, Jeju Island. Was a good example. Yeah. George, yes. Gridmates. Yes, I'm the co-founder of uh, Gridmates. Hello, Andre. Nice to meet you all. Uh, for us, in order to provide a solution to the transactive energy and uh, the peer-to-peer -peer energy sharing, we have developed a virtual meter. This virtual meter is actually carried in the mobile phone and it is deployed in the cloud. So it's a cloud-based platform that captures virtual energy consumption, which is the transaction of energy. Do you find uh, in the future an integration between smart meters and virtual meters that, I will, uh, that will model the transaction of energy? Absolutely. I mean, we are talking about a mega infrastructure merge, and that's a part of that. You're, we have already seen IT infrastructure, not just IT, but analytics, sensors, hardware, overlaid that. So the next phase of it is what value does that really provide in the palm of your hand? 
I guess the, as the smart meter person on the panel, um, <laughs> the answer would be yes. I mean, obviously the smart meter is just a point on the system, but looking at the energy that flows beyond the meter and understanding where it goes both at a residential, commercial, industrial is something that um, I think that's kind of the next phase in, uh, in the direction we're going because in order to control your usage, you need to understand it more than just that single point. So uh, our, our idea was to provide energy roaming. So like you are holding your mobile phone, you go anywhere you want. Now you can carry your energy wherever you want, and you can compensate wherever you consume energy. So but the, you know, the, the physics is king. At the end of the day, you may have the grooviest, like nicest app, <laughs> but I mean, the only real law in the universe is laws of physics. Don't but, ever forget that. In the on. middle of all these fancy apps and all that, we still need to operate a system with electrons subject to Kirchhoff voltage laws. And, and so having said that, I guess my observation would be that the the real pilots around arbitrage at the consumer level are happening in Europe and in, uh, and in um, Korea. Uh, I don't see a lot of that happening in the U.S. yet. Same with cell phone technology. We are behind. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Last question, perhaps. Just two, two more. So if two the more. last... Two, two questions, two questions. Yeah, the last inarguable uh, theory is the physics. The one that's inescapable is economics. And the one kind of historical analogy that comes to mind for me is the, the federal interstate uh, highway system. And there were winners, there were losers. And so we tend to talk about, like, if, if consumption or burden goes down, there goes revenues, and how are we going to fund it? And so going back to that, there were so many different uh, contributors to it, whether it was highway tax, fuel tax, et cetera, et cetera. Again, you know, it was the death of small town America in some cases because businesses died. So now, with all that said, how do we you know, create you know, those learning experiences from a historical, from an economic standpoint to be able to pull it all together so that there are winners and let fewer losers? Because I hear you know, we're, we're going to lose. Go ahead. Hold, hold on, Mr. Anybody else wants to jump on that? Mr. student has it. Yeah. Okay, he's got it. You know, I give you a little bit of a background. In 1998, I had the privilege of briefing California with Energy Commission others that at EPRI, when I was at EPRI as the head of mathematics and information sciences, because it's 503, we couldn't do policy recommendation. We could do policy analysis. So modeled the entire West Coast and showed that if there is a congestion in the lines or if a generator is done, prices are going to go through the roof. So basically showed that the act in 1996 that passed unanimously in California State Assembly violated laws of physics and laws of economics. They mandated a 10% cut until for about three years, and then when real-time prices kicked in, it went through the roof. It only limited the computer program, uh, was limited to $9,999, that's it. Otherwise, it would have gone further. They told me, well, Dr. Amin, you're right. What do we do about it? I said, I cannot do, do policy recommendation mm -hmm. to you. Seriously, you are a nonprofit. But often, we don't do this kind of measurement. Measure once, measure twice, measure three times, based on physics and economics, not based on based on hearsay and who is the loudest person in the room, who is going to do lobbying behind the scenes to pass it. Both sides agreed to that state assembly that passed in 1996. In the process of making it unanimous, they made it violate laws of physics and economics. So going forward, I submit to you that those are the two things that we need a transparent talk at a local level, but with a larger view of how is it going to affect the region, how is it going to connect to other regions and the nation and North America. It can be done. We haven't really done that. We haven't really had an energy policy. Every president pays lip service to it. But then if one does something, the other one who comes completely derails it, changes it. And energy is used as a, as a pinball machine, basically. And, and then for companies, what do we do? What do we invest in? There is a lot of uncertainty. Sure. So coming back to your question, Energy policy is the kind of mega marathon. It's not a mad rush, a hundred yard rush to get to the end line. Very different from internet or telecom model for that reason. And there's a lot of, from, from FERBA, from background, there's a lot of laws that govern it. 
So how do we advance progress with this constraint in the macro system, with standards, with technology, and with policy? So with that, unfortunately, I have to close the panel. Everybody, thank this lady and gentlemen.